chapter six of pixie o'shaughnessy by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain a novel amusement during the weeks which followed pixie's prep became a byword among her companions for no amount of goading seemed sufficient to keep her attention from roaming from her books during the hours when it was most necessary that she should give them her undivided attention however sturdily she might begin in ten minutes time her eyes were wandering about the room she was scribbling on the margin of her book or twisting her handkerchief into a new variety of rag doll the well-meaning kate finding frowns and nudges losing their effect resorted to more drastic measures such as the prick of a pin or a tug of the elf-like locks but the victim's howls and protestations not only disturbed her companions but took so long to pacify that the experiment had to be abandoned how pixie managed to sustain even her very low place in the class was a wonder to her companions but in truth she had an unusually quick brain so that when she chose to apply herself she learnt as much as slower girls would do in twice the time while her irish wit enabled her to place her scraps of knowledge in the most advantageous light and rescued her from awkward questionings nowhere was this faculty more marked than in french of which she knew the least yet in which subject she made the most rapid progress it was clear to a pair of uncommonly sharp eyes that miss phipps's leniency would some day come to an end and that she would then find herself in the position of being obliged either to speak french or not to speak at all to a born chatterbox the latter alternative seemed the acme of misery so it behooved her to prepare for speech before the dread verdict was given which she did in a manner astonishing to her companions of french grammar she had the poorest opinion but she was sharp as a magpie to pick up the phrases of others and store them for her own use the morning after mademoiselle had suffered from a headache pixie's handkerchief was soaked with offerings of eau de cologne from the various girls to whom she had repeated ejaculations of distress she discoursed exhaustively upon the weather to every one who could be induced to listen and recited exercise phrases to the school cat until her tongue grew quite nimble over the words mademoiselle was an object of intense interest and curiosity to her new pupil she was the first foreigner whom pixie had known and there was something in her dark eager face which arrested the child's attention mademoiselle was quick and nervous subject to fits of unreasonable irritation but at other times there was a sad far-away look in her eyes and then her voice would take a softer cadence so that when she said chérie one pupil at least forgot all the scoldings which had gone before pixie felt irresistibly drawn to mademoiselle in her bouts of depression she could not have explained the attraction but in her heart she felt that they were both exiles and that mademoiselle pined for her own sunny land even as she pined for the dear green isle which seemed so far away she longed for mademoiselle to notice her to show her some special mark of favour but longed in vain until at last a day dawned which brought her into notice in a manner which was scarcely to her liking it was a wet saturday afternoon and wet saturday afternoons are abominations to every boarding school girl and the cause of endless grumblings and repinings ethel and kate had gone out to tea with an old maiden lady who lived in the neighbourhood and had still further deepened their friend's depression before departing by drawing a most roseate picture of the joys before them she is awfully kind they had explained of their hostess she gives you the most galumptious teas and the best part of it is she has an enormous appetite herself so you can eat as much as you like without fear of looking greedy no wonder the poor stay-at-homes looked glum after this no wonder they sighed with envy as they thought of the thick bread and butter in store for themselves the elder girls provided themselves with books and sat in rows before the fire 
while artistic spirits set themselves copies and filled up page after page of their sketching books flora stitched on a table centre designed to be a birthday present for her mother and the younger girls clustered round pixie and besought her to think of some new means of amusement think of something pixie do it's so dull and we are sick of the stupid old games what do you do at home when it rained and you couldn't go out i've never seen it rain hard enough to keep me indoors if i wanted to be out returned pixie with a toss of the head but i've had fine fun indoors sometimes when i didn't feel disposed for exertion ratting in the barn is good sport or grooming the pony or feeding the animals and pretending it is the zoo but you can't do those things here it's hard to think of anything amusing when you are shut up in one room we can go out on the landing if we like i vote we do and be by ourselves the fifth forms are sure to tell us not to the moment we have thought of something nice come along now before they notice us no sooner said than done the little band of conspirators slipped from the room and stood without on the square landing five short frocked girls all gazing eagerly confidently into the face of their leader pixie what shall we do pixie racked her brains in despair for not a single idea would come to her aid and yet to acknowledge such a want of invention would have been to forfeit her position and therefore not to be thought of for a second her eyes roamed from side to side and lit upon a table on which some working materials happened to be lying a basket a folded length of cloth and a roll of wide green binding such as was used to edge old-fashioned window curtains pixie looked at it thoughtfully fingered it to ascertain its weight shook it out to discover its length and cried eagerly just the thing might have been made for it would you like to see me lasso the next person who comes upstairs lasso the girls were not quite sure of the meaning of the word but pixie explained it suiting the action to the word a lasso was a rope with a noose at one end so and it was used to catch wild horses or anything else you happened to chase you stood with the rope gathered up in your hand so and then took aim and sent it flying out suddenly so pat could do it beautifully and he had taught her too but she could not always manage very well if you caught a girl from above she would be startled out of her wits and squeal like anything it would be splendid fun the next one then who came upstairs the girls were divided between horror and delight dared she really would it hurt what would miss phipps say did she really think she ought but their agitation acted as fuel to pixie's determination and she would only laugh and lean over the banisters experimenting with the long green rope and altering the length until it met with her approval five minutes passed and nobody appeared ten minutes and the conspirators were beginning to grow impatient when from below came the unmistakable sound of an ascending footstep the orders of the chief had been that when this happened her attendants were to withdraw to a safe distance so that no movement or sound of muffled laughter should warn the victim of her peril so the girls retreated obediently leaving pixie to crouch on the floor until the eventful moment when a head appeared on the landing six steps below it came the top of a smooth brown head and on the moment out flew the rope whirled into space with a skilful jerk which sent the noose flying wide and with an accuracy of aim which brought it right round the neck of the newcomer she squealed indeed but horror of horrors she squealed in french with such staccato oh's and ah's of astonishment as only could have come from one person in the house it was mademoiselle herself and lifting her glance she beheld six horrified faces peering at her over the banisters six pairs of startled eyes six mouths agape with dismay she looked and then as it seemed with one stride was in their midst with her hands gripping pixie by the shoulders now it happened that mademoiselle was in her most irritable mood this afternoon 
for all day long she had been struggling against what for convenience sake she called a headache but which might more honestly have been described as a heartache instead a teacher cannot explain to thirty pupils that she has received a letter from home which has seemed to drop a veil before the sky but such letters come all the same and make it difficult to bear the hundred and one little annoyances and trials of temper which fall to her lot mademoiselle's letter had told of the illness of a beloved father and as she dare not sit down and have a good cry to relieve her feelings she was in a pent-up state of nerves which made her the worst possible subject for a practical joke the rope in pixie's hand marked her out as the principal offender and she was called to order in a breathless stream of french which left her dumb and bewildered i can't understand she stammered and mademoiselle struggled to express herself in sufficiently expressive english you bad girl you rude bad girl what have you done what you mean by playing your tricks on me i will not have it i will complain to miss phipps how dare you throw your strings about me to catch me as i come upstairs impertinent disobedient please mademoiselle it was a lasso i didn't know it was you i said i would do it to the first person who came and i didn't see your face it was only a joke a joke you catch me by the throat you hang me by the neck and you call it a joke you wicked impertinent girl you shall be punished for this pixie heaved a sigh so sepulchral that it might also have been called a groan instead oh it's just my luck she said dismally when i tried to show off before pat and the girls i couldn't do it one time in a hundred and just now when i'd have no credit but only get into trouble i caught you the very first try did she mean to be impertinent mademoiselle looked down with sharp suspicion but even in her excited condition she could not mistake that downcast look and troubled disconsolate frown her voice grew a trifle less sharp but she was very angry still you ought to be ashamed playing such tricks it is always the same thing there is no peace since you have come these girls were quite good and mild but you make them as wild as yourself i will teach you to behave better you will come with me to the schoolroom and write out a verb i will mademoiselle said pixie meekly so meekly that her companions fondly hoped that such exemplary submission would win forgiveness but no mademoiselle flounced downstairs and pixie followed at her heels to seat herself in solitary state at one end of the deserted classroom while mademoiselle took possession of the desk and began to correct a pile of exercise books to write out a verb is not as a rule a very lengthy matter but mademoiselle's punishment verbs had invariably a phrase attached which gave to them an added appropriateness but very much lengthened the task i am sorry that i was rude to mademoiselle was the verb which poor pixie was to-day condemned to conjugate and the big straggling sentences amplified the statement until it seemed impossible to express it in any other way i am sorry that i was rude to mademoiselle i was sorry that i was rude to mademoiselle i shall or will be sorry that i was rude to mademoiselle at intervals of every two or three minutes mademoiselle glanced from her work to the little figure at the other end of the room but each time pixie's head was bent over her task and the wandering eyes were glued to their task such industry seemed so unnatural that the onlooker became first puzzled and then uneasy and at last resorted to coughing and moving about in her chair in order to satisfy curiosity in vain pixie's head went down lower than ever and the pen scratched away without a moment's cessation for she was enduring that unreasoning panic of fear which sensitive children suffer when they are in disgrace with their elders she had been brought up in an atmosphere of tender indulgence had been the adored baby of the household who had never heard the sound of an angry voice so that now to sit alone in a room with a person whom she had displeased reduced her to a condition of trembling fear 
her eyelids felt weighed down a lump rose in her throat and she trembled as with cold and then presently the dreaded voice spoke again and mademoiselle said pixie come here bring your verb the wretched scribe had not yet finished her conjugation being about imperatively to command herself to be sorry that she had been rude to mademoiselle but she was too nervous to explain and stood twisting her hands together and staring at the carpet while mademoiselle turned over the pages she bit her lips once or twice as she read and her eyes twinkled but pixie did not see that and the voice which spoke sounded alarmingly stern it is well badly written you make your letters too big and such blots i cannot have such blots what have you been doing to make such blots as these they are not blots please mademoiselle they are only only what then spots spots echoed mademoiselle blankly spots blots blots spots i do not understand what is then the difference between blots and spots blots is made with ink when pixie was agitated as at the present moment grammar was by no means her strong point and spots is made with with et bien and with what then tears came the answer in the softest echo of a voice and mademoiselle looked down at the woe-begone face with startled eyes tears your tears but why should you cry it is not so dreadful to write a verb i might have given you worse punishment than that perhaps it was because you had missed the afternoon with your friends i cannot think a girl of your age should cry over a simple verb i thought it was a very elaborate verb said pixie faintly but it wasn't that that made me cry it was hurting your feelings mademoiselle mademoiselle leant back into her chair and looked intently at the shrinking figure look up shelley she said softly and pixie's fear fell from her like a mantle she saw a hand outstretched and clasped it eagerly i never meant to hang you mademoiselle it was only a joke the girls asked me to amuse them and we think it fine sport to lasso one another at home how was i to know it would be you when i gave my word i would catch the first one that came upstairs i didn't mean to be impertinent but ma petite you should not play such tricks at all mademoiselle shook her head but she was smiling as she spoke for she was beginning to realize that no disrespect had been meant to herself and that she had been unduly stern in her denunciations it is not the thing for a young lady at school it is only for wild how do you call them cowboys out on the prairie if you do it at home it is not my affair but if your father should see you some day he must be shocked like me i'm the youngest of six and me father won't have me thwarted sighed pixie lapsing into her brogue as she usually did when agitated nobody's ever angry with me at bally william i get into mischief the day long and it's all quite happy and comfortable if i'm quiet and well behaved bridgie is after giving me a mixture for says she the child's ill there's not been a sound out of her this day i wish i was back in me own country mademoiselle and then i shouldn't trouble you any more i wish i was back in my country too sighed the other softly and two big tears started in the brown eyes and trickled slowly down the cheeks my father is ill and needs me and i cannot be with him i feel as if i could have wings and fly i long so much to go but i must stay here and work my art is very sad and sometimes i get cross too cross perhaps because i cannot bear any more then you girls talk amongst yourselves and say how she is bad tempered that mademoiselle how she is cross and strict that is what you say very often n'est-ce pas we do replied pixie frankly it was one of the irishisms which amused her companions that she never by any chance gave a simple yes or no in reply to a question it was always i am i will i do as the case might be 
we do she replied now and then hastened to soften the admission by coaxing but i wouldn't be troubling meself about that if i were you for they don't mind it a bit i drew a picture of you the other day with a bubble coming out of your mouth and bow wow wow written on it like a dog because you are always barking but there isn't a bite in ye and all the girls say you aren't half as bad as the mademoiselle who was here before well there are some conditions of mind when we are thankful for the smallest grain of comfort and mademoiselle smiled and flicked the tears from her eyes they are too kind i am much obliged but another time when i bark as you call it you will perhaps remember that your teachers are like yourselves and i have the same feelings when you come first to school you have to be comforted because you are homesick but we are homesick too and when you get bad news you cry and are excused from your work but we must go on the same as before and if it is difficult to learn your lessons it is also difficult to teach well now you may go you will remember not to be rude to mademoiselle again eh she held out her hand smiling more brightly this time and pixie seized it eagerly i will and i hope your father will get well soon you will see him at christmas and that isn't very long now only forty-eight days to-morrow i mark them off on my calendar no that is so sad i shall not see him till summer he is going to my brother in italy where it is warm and sunny and it is too far for me to go there with him it costs too much money and the little house in paris will be shut up till he returns so i must stay in england all through the dark long winter when the sun never shines and i shiver 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 all day and all night i shall forget what it is like to be warm before the spring arrives pixie rubbed the cold hands with a sympathetic touch but she made no remark and presently went from the schoolroom to rejoin her companions and make the most of the hours which still remained while mademoiselle went wearily on with the task of correction she forgot all about her own complaints of cold but when she retired to bed that night a delightful surprise was in store for the sheets were warm instead of cold and her chilled feet came in contact with something soft and hot which proved upon examination to be an india-rubber water bottle encased in a flannel bag mademoiselle drew a long gasp of rapture and nestled down again with a feeling of comfort to which she had long been a stranger a day or two earlier miss phipps had spoken of the necessity of putting more coverings on the beds as the frost had set in unusually early and mademoiselle sleepily attributed this new comfort as another instance of the principal's consideration for her assistance she felt certain that it must be so as night after night the welcome warmth was in waiting and more than once determined to express her appreciation but life was busy and there was such an accumulation of work as the period of examination approached that there seemed to be no time to speak of anything but school affairs End of chapter 6
my brain feels like jelly it won't work i shall be getting softening of the brain at this rate sighed flora rubbing her cheeks up and down between her bands until she looked like a fat india-rubber doll i keep mixing things up until i don't seem to have a clear idea left and my mother has set her heart on my taking a good place she will look sad if i come out bottom and i do hate and detest people looking sad i would far rather they scolded and had done with it my people don't worry their heads about lessons they sent me to school because they think it polishes a girl and rubs off the angles don't you know said lottie with an air she was the richest girl in the school who took all the extras and put her name down for every concert and entertainment without thinking of the expense her parents had a house in town to which they came regularly every spring during which season lottie's friends received many delightful invitations she had unlimited pocket money also and was lavish in gifts to those who happened to be in her favour a fact which a certain number of girls found it impossible to banish from their minds and thus lottie held a little court over which she reigned as queen while the more earnest-minded of the pupils adored margaret and would hear no one compared to the sweet school mother clara was a margaret worshipper so she felt in duty bound to snub lottie on this as on every possible occasion i don't see much polish about you she retorted brutally and it's ridiculous to come to school at all if you don't mean to work if it's only prunes and prism you want why didn't you go to board with a dancing mistress and practice how to come in and out of a room and bow to your friends and cut your old schoolfellows when you meet them in the road you'd find it useful my dear the last sentence was a deliberate hit for a former pupil had reported that during a visit to a well-known watering-place when she herself was returning unkempt and sandy from a cockling expedition she had encountered lottie walking on the parade with a number of fashionable visitors and that after one hasty glance in her direction miss lottie had become so wonderfully interested in what was going on at the other side of the road that she altogether forgot to return her bow needless to say lottie had been reminded more than once of this incident so that even pixie the newest comer was familiar with its incidents though she could not bring herself to believe in such deliberate snobbery to-day as lottie flushed and margaret looked a pained reproach it was pixie who rushed to the rescue wriggling about in her seat and clasping and unclasping her hands in the earnestness of her defence clara montague you've no business accusing lottie you weren't there so you can't tell perhaps the sun was in her eyes you can't see a man from a woman when it's shining full in your face though they may see you clear enough and believe you're shamming or perhaps the dust was blowing i've been blind myself with dust before now and come into the house looking as though i'd been crying for weeks why should she pretend not to know a friend least of all when she'd been cockling deed i'd have been more affectionate than ever in the hope she'd say help yourself me dear lend me your handkerchief and i'll give you a nice little bundle to take home for your tea the margaret girls gave a simultaneous shriek of laughter at the idea of miss lottie carrying a handkerchief full of cockles and eva the lottie girl smiled approvingly at the little speaker for was she not advocating the position of their chief flora nodded encouragingly across the hearth and cried good for you pixie never listen to second-hand stories against your friends and kate added meaningly go on believing in human nature as long as you can my dear you're young yet when you are as old as i am it will be time to open your eyes but to go back to the last subject but one don't you give way to nerves girls and begin worrying about the exams already i've noticed that just about the middle of the term there always comes a discouragement stage to anyone who is anxious to do well 
the first energy with which one begins to work has worn off and as it is too soon for the final spurt there comes a dull flat time when one worries and frets and gets down in the lowest depths of dumps i spoke about it at home and my father says every worker feels the same artists when they are painting pictures and authors when they are writing books they have an idea and set to work all delight and excitement believing that they are going to do the best thing they have ever done for a little time all goes well and then they began to grow discouraged and worried and think they might as well give it up at once for it is going to be a dismal failure they know something is wrong but they can't see what it is and they mope about and don't know what to try next father told me a story about millet the man who painted bubbles you know and heaps of other beautiful things he was so miserable about a picture once that he grew quite ill worrying about it his wife tried to persuade him to leave it alone for a few days and then take a rest but no he would not hear of it so one fine day when he was out she just took the law into her own hands and had it carried down and hidden in the cellar when he came home he went straight to the studio and my dears i am glad i didn't happen to be in the house that's all i know what my father is like when he can't find a clothes brush or someone has moved the matches out of the dressing-room millet raged about like a wild animal but his wife was quite firm and determined and wouldn't tell him where it was for several days he was obliged to go out and interest himself in other ways and when he was quite well again she had the picture brought up and he simply looked at it and laughed he knew at once what was wrong and how to put it right i say cried flora eagerly do tell that story to miss phipps she might give us a week's holiday and send us to see the sights of london do kate get it up in french and tell it to-night at tea you don't know how much good it might do it's a very good story but i fail to see where the moral comes in it hardly applies to us i think said clara in her superior manner and kate breathlessly vindicated her position yes it does of course it does it shows that this anxious stage is a natural thing which all workers have to live through and even if we can't leave off lessons altogether we can help ourselves by not giving way to nerves but going steadily on knowing that we shall feel all right again in a few days besides there's the exeat coming that will make a nice break well, i never worry about lessons do i cried pixie pluming herself complacently the part of kate's lecture which had dealt with over-anxiety about work had appealed with special force to one listener at least and pixie was delighted to find that she was free from failing in one direction at least i never did miss minnett that's the one who used to teach us she said i never paid any attention at all there was one day she was questioning me about grammar pixie o'shaughnessy she says you've been over this one page until it's worn transparent for pity's sake she says be done with it and get on to something fresh let me see if you can remember to-day what i taught you yesterday afternoon how many kinds of verbs are there there are two i said and with that she was all smiles and noddings so there are now you're quite right and what will be their names verb and adverb says i quite haughty and the howl that went out of her you might have heard from cork to galway that was all the grammar she'd managed to teach me you don't know very much more now do you chicken said margaret bending her head so that her cheek rested upon the rough dark head just bring your books to me any time you get puzzled and i'll try to make it clear talking of the term holiday girls it is time we began to make our plans 
how many of you are going out lottie are you clara kate pixie we had better find out first how many there will be clara had had hopes that the maiden lady with the appetite would rise to the occasion but alas she had betaken herself to stay with a relative pixie was sure that jack could not spare time to have her for a whole day and besides she was going to have tea with him the saturday before all the girls seemed fated to spend the holiday at school save only the two sisters mabel and violet who were to be entertained by a kind aunt and to choose their own entertainment for the afternoon and lottie who was fortunate as usual i am doubly engaged for the evening she announced with a flourish i wrote home to my people about the holiday and mother asked some friends to have me for part of the day they live in a regular mansion as big as two or three houses like this rolled into one and they know all sorts of grand people i am going to dinner and it's most exciting for i don't know whom i may meet the prince and princess of wales are at sandringham what a pity sighed kate the sarcastic it's so awfully trying to come down to lords and ladies don't you know you will hardly trouble to put on your best dress i should think the pea-green satin with the pink flounces will be good enough for them the margaret girls laughed hysterically at this exhibition of wit but lottie's followers shot indignant glances across the room and pixie asked innocently have you got a pea-green satin lottie and pink flounces to it you will be fine i have a little pink fan out of a cracker last year when there was company at the chase i'll lend it to you if you like and then you'll be all complete thank you pixie o'shaughnessy you are a kind little girl i shan't want it this time but i'll be sure to remind you when i do replied lottie with unusual warmth of manner for the child's sincerity had touched a soft spot in her vain heart and she had an increasing desire to include her in the number of her admirers later on when they were left alone together at the end of the schoolroom she put her arm around the tiny waist and said caressingly talking of party dresses what are you going to wear yourself on tuesday evening you have to put on your best things you know just as if you were going out will i pixie looked surprised but absolutely unperturbed but i haven't a rag to my back but the black you see every night bridgie said it's not likely you'll be visiting at court until your education's finished so this old grenadine will see you through until the ship comes home from its next voyage it's gone a long way this time says she and between you and me i expect the storms will swamp it but i've taken the best pieces out of my old dress and esmeralda's and barring the darn on the back seam i defy ye to tell it from new so that's all i've got as i told you before and party or no party it will have to do lottie looked at her in horrified sympathy but not a sigh of regret clouded the beaming face the head was tilting to and fro in its usual complacent fashion the shabby little flounce of a skirt was whisking to and fro such a depth of poverty seemed incomprehensible to the child of wealthy parents and she was moved to an unusual desire to help never before had she been known to lend one of her possessions to another girl but now she said quite eagerly i have a lace collar pixie a very pretty collar i'll lend it to you and a white ribbon for your hair it would lighten your dress wonderfully and there is a brooch too and a little gold bangle she paused looking inquiringly to see the result of her offer for one could never tell how it would be received some girls might be pleased others might consider it almost an insult and she would be sorry to offend the funny little thing but pixie was not offended she had too much of the o'shaughnessy blood in her veins to object to have things made easy for her at the expense of another and she felt no embarrassment in taking the good things that came her way oh ye darlin she cried rapturously will ye lend them to me really think of me now with a bracelet on me arm and a brooch at me neck they wouldn't be knowin me at home i wish to-day was tuesday and what shall we do with ourselves before it's time to dress up 
lottie referred the question to margaret who as head girl had been busy thinking out plans for the enjoyment of her friends i thought of asking if we might go to see the cinematograph at the polytechnic she replied miss phipps promised to take us some day and if we could do some shopping first and have tea afterwards it would be a delightful way of spending the afternoon there is one thing that we must buy while we have the chance and that's a present for fraulein her birthday is next week and she is such a kind old dear that she deserves something nice i want at least a shilling from every one and as much more as they can afford i wonder what we had better get i know what she would love a scent bottle for her dressing-table like the one mademoiselle has we could not afford one quite so good but we could get a very nice size for about two pounds one day when i was in mademoiselle's room fraulein came in and took up the bottle and began admiring it and saying how nice it was to get presents which were good to look at as well as to use she has not many pretty things poor fraulein and i think she would really enjoy a taste of luxury mademoiselle has her initials engraven on the glass but that would be too expensive for us we can have them on the stopper instead and who gave mademoiselle her bottle was it some one here asked pixie curiously whereupon kate tossed her head with an air of exaggerated dismay my dear how can you don't say that to mademoiselle i implore you she would have a fit we are all commoners and english commoners at that and the lady who gave her that precious bottle was madame de la marquise de something or other the mother of her beloved pupil isolte andre adele marie therese the most perfect and beautiful and clever and amiable jeune fille that was ever created kate paused hitched one shoulder to her ear spread out her hands and elevated her eyebrows in ridiculous mimicry of mademoiselle's mannerisms did she ever neglect her work jamais never did she ever forget that she was a jeune fille and behave like a wild rough boy jamais jamais was she ever like these english rude impertinent disobedient mais non always the same cet ange the most wise the most amiable and when she has finished her education and made her debut to be the most beautiful and admired wherever she has gone she has wept wept i tell you to say adieu to her beloved mademoiselle and she has given her a chain for her neck and madame la Quille, that beautiful handsome botel really pixie you are behind the times if you don't know about isolt just turn mademoiselle on to her next time you are with her on the walk and you won't have to exert yourself any more she will sing her praises until you come in i will pixie said sturdily and i'll see that bottle too i must see that bottle i'll go into mademoiselle's room next time i have a chance and have a good look at it all to myself the girl smiled but took little note of a determination which seemed natural enough under the circumstances a week afterwards they remembered it with very different feelings and pixie's own words were brought up in judgment against her End of chapter 7chapter eight of pixie o'shaughnessy by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain pixie in trouble it was already dark when the crocodile passed in at the gates of holly house on its return from the expedition to town and miss phipps gave instructions that the girls were to go straight to their rooms to dress for the evening full dress was the rule for the evenings of term holiday for even if nothing particular was going on and no extra guests expected it gave one a gala feeling to don a light frock and gaze down upon one's very best shoes and stockings before leaving for town in the morning 
visits had been paid to the box-room to take the rarely used splendours from their wrappings and now they lay stretched out in all their glory on the narrow beds white blue and pink a very wealth of colour and luxury pixie o'shaughnessy having no adornment to do for herself acted as lady's maid to her bedroom with much satisfaction to her mistresses and credit to herself she brushed kate's hair until it was so smooth and flat as to be almost invisible from a front view she tied ethel's sash and the ribbon to match which confined the ends of her curls and she fastened flora's dress which was a matter of difficulty and time for though it was let out regularly each holiday time it invariably grew too tight before it was needed again i can't help it the poor thing protested miserably i don't eat half as much as ethel and she's thin as a stick it's my fate i was born fat and i go on growing fatter and fatter all the time i shall be a fat woman in a show before i am done with it it's hard lines for i should so love to be slim and willowy that's what the heroines are in books and it makes me quite ill every time i read it nothing exciting ever happens to fat people the thin ones get all the fun and excitement and marry the nice man while the poor fatty stays at home and waits upon her hand and foot then she grows into an aunt and takes charge of the nephews and nieces when they have fever or measles or when the parents go abroad for a holiday every one imposes upon her just because she is fat no indeed then it is because she's good-natured look at yourself now you're always laughing declared pixie soothingly hold your breath a single moment while i get the better of this hook ye'll not need to curtsy too low i'm thinking or you'll go off like a cracker and the elegant dress that it is too i remember the night bridgie went to her first ball the hunt ball it was over at ross Killee. it was me mother's wedding dress that she wore and she looked like a picture in it the darlin me mother was for having it altered to be in the fashion but me father says leave it alone you'll spoil it if ye alter a stitch it's better than fashionable he says it's artistic and fits the child like her own skin so away it was put in bridgie's cupboard and esmeralda comes peeping at it and thinks she what yellow lace it would be a disgrace to us all to have the girl dancing about with that dirty stuff round her neck so not a word did she speak but off with the lace and washed it herself with a good hard rub and plenty of blue bag then she ironed it with a morsel of starch to make it stand out and show itself off and stitched it on again as proud as could be it was to be a surprise for bridgie and me dears it was a surprise mother and bridgie screeching at the top of their voices and looking as if the plague was upon us would ye believe it it was just what they liked to have the lace that colour and it was the bad turn esmeralda had done them starching it up like new off it all came and mother found an old lace scarf yellower than the first and pinned it round bridgie's shoulders and she had pearls round her neck and a star in her hair and lord atram danced the first dance with her and told me mother she was the prettiest thing he had seen for a twelvemonth but esmeralda sulked all the evening and it was very lively for me alone at home with her tantrums flora chuckled softly and ethel gave a shrill hee <laughs> from her cubicle at the other end of the room i do think you must be the funniest family you seem always to be doing the most extraordinary things we never have such experiences at home we used to go along quietly and steadily and there is never any hubbub nor excitement you seem to have a constant succession of alarms and adventures we do so 
said pixie with relish scarcely the day that we're not all rushing about in distraction about something either it's the boys tumbling out of the barn and cutting themselves open or father bringing home accidents from the meat or the ferret getting loose in the drawing-room when there's visitors present or not a pound of fresh meat in the house and the bishop taking it into his head to drive over ten miles to lunch and bridgie was for going out and killing a chicken and engaging him in conversation while it was cooked but mother says no the man's hungry bring lunch in the same as if we were alone and leave the rest to me and when he had asked the blessing she says smiling it's nothing but ham and eggs i've got to offer ye bishop but there's enough welcome for ten courses and the smile of him would have done you good to behold three eggs he ate and half a pig besides and it's the best lunch i've had since i said good-bye to short jackets he said when he was finished now now pixie not so much talking get on with your own dressing you little chatterbox cried kate putting her head round the corner of the curtain and giving a tug to the end of the short black skirt flora can manage now and you have not too much time if you are to catch lottie before she goes out hurry up hurry up pixie retired obediently for kate was head girl of the dormitory and must needs be obeyed so one black frock came off and another went on the stout boots were exchanged for slippers and then the others having already departed she turned down the gas and skipped along to the room where lottie stood waiting for her a vision of spotless white that's right i was just wondering what had become of you sit down here and i'll put on the collar and just call out if i stick a pin in you by mistake i'm going to fasten it with this little brooch there isn't it sweet i think i will give it to you to keep i never wear it and you might just as well have it yes i will you shall have it for a term holiday present because you were a kind little girl and didn't join the other girls when they were nasty to me last week are you pleased with it now oh lottie you darlin is it really me very own pixie was fairly breathless with pleasure and excitement and could only exclaim rapturously and gaze at the reflection of the new treasure while lottie smiled well pleased to have given so much pleasure yes she told herself she was really devoted to pixie o'shaughnessy there was something so sweet and taking about the child that it made one feel nice to give her pleasure and she pinned and arranged and tied ribbons with as much zest as if she were arranging her own toilette there now you are done i think you look very nice the collar goes so well with that black dress my word aren't i stylish i just look beautiful cried pixie poking her ugly little face close to the glass and twisting round and round to examine herself in all aspects she kissed lottie effusively expressed a hundred thanks and danced downstairs into the schoolroom where the girls were standing about in twos and threes looking so grand that it was quite difficult to recognize them they all stared at her as the latest arrival and pixie being conscious of their scrutiny held out her arms stiffly on either side and revolved slowly round and round on one heel the girls laughed uproariously at first then suddenly the laughs subsided into twitters and pixie stopping to see what was wrong espied miss phipps and the three governesses standing just inside the doorway watching with the rest and applauding with their hands it was an embarrassing moment and the performer made a quick dash behind a sofa to screen herself from publicity but she had not been there five minutes before she was called upon to answer a question pixie kate tells me you were in lottie's room before you came down was she nearly ready she was miss phipps quite ready only waiting for me she's on a white dress and never mind that i want you to run upstairs please and tell her that the cab is here she must put on her wraps and come down at once i will miss phipps 
there was a whisk of short black skirts and off she went running lightly upstairs and raising her voice in rich musical cry lottie lottie the real irish voice she ought to be able to sing charmingly when she is older said miss phipps to mademoiselle and mademoiselle nodded her head in assent i hope so it is a great charm for a young girl to sing well and she is not pretty la pauvre petite no yet the father is fine-looking and my friends tell me that the two sisters are quite beauties and all the family wonderfully handsome with this one exception but pixie is better than pretty she is charming would you be kind enough to go to the dining-room to see if everything is ready mademoiselle it is time we began tea mademoiselle departed and came back to give the required signal when the girls filed slowly across the hall casting curious glances at lottie as she came downstairs she was wrapped in a long white cloak and had a fleecy shawl thrown over her head almost covering her face from view she looked very dainty and when the door opened and they beheld her step into the cab they felt a rising of envy which could not be entirely removed even by the sight of the luxurious tea spread out on the dining-room table lottie is a lucky creature sighed clara discontentedly she's always going out i wish my people lived near instead of at the other end of england i am glad i am north country though i don't like southerners i agree with tennyson true and firm and tender is the north false and fair and smiling is the south it isn't false it's sweet it is false i tell you false and fair and sweet and fair and ask miss phipps then if you won't believe me oh i say look at the icing on the cake we didn't have icing last time doesn't the table look nice i do think it is sweet of miss phipps to take so much trouble sit by me and we will get hold of pixie and make her tell us stories it makes me laugh just to hear that child talk her brogue doesn't get a bit better i hope it may never pixie here sit by us we've kept a place but pixie shook her head for she had been engaged to flora ever since breakfast and was already seating herself at the other end of the table she did not speak much however during the meal for experience had taught what it had been difficult to express in words that it was not respectful to her teachers to chatter in their presence as she would do with her companions she applied herself instead to the good things that had been provided and ate away steadily until she had sampled the contents of every plate upon the table and could superintend the choice of her companions with the wisdom of experience miss phipps had drawn out a programme of games for the evening's amusement and later on the older pupils took it in turns to play waltzes and polkas while the others danced the teachers joined in with the rest and it was a proud girl who had miss phipps for a partner while mademoiselle was so light and agile that it was like dancing with a feather and fraulein felt like a heavy log lying against one's arm then every one sat down and puffed and panted while jeanie the scotch girl danced a highland fling and when pixie called out an appropriate hoch hoch the teachers laughed as heartily as the girls for be it well understood there are things which are allowed on term holiday which the rashest spirit dare not attempt on working days then two pretty sisters went through the stately figures of a minuet and margaret sang a song in her sweet voice pronouncing the words so distinctly that you really knew what she was singing about which nowadays is a very rare and wonderful accomplishment altogether it was a most festive evening and flora was in the act of remarking complacently we really are a most accomplished school when suddenly the scene changed and an expression of horrified anxiety appeared on every face for mademoiselle came rushing into the room which she had left but a few minutes before and the tears stood in her eyes and her face was scarlet with mingled grief and anger she held in one hand 
the gold stopper of her precious scent bottle and in the other a number of pieces of broken glass at sight of which a groan of dismay sounded on every hand voila regarde see what i have found i go to my room and the air is full of scent and i turn out the gas and there it is on the dressing-table before my eyes in pieces my bottle that i have kept all these years that was given to me by my friend my dear good friend her voice broke off in a sob and miss phipps came forward to examine the pieces with an expression of real distress but mademoiselle how has it happened you found it on the table you say not on the floor if it had been on the floor you might perhaps have swept it off in leaving the room and not heard the sound against the mat but on the table how could it be broken on the table someone has been touching it and let it drop i be so careless as to break my bottle it is impossible to think of i never come away without a look to see that it is safe i dust my dressing-table myself every morning so that no one shall interfere with my things the servants know that it is so when i come downstairs this evening it was all right i have not been upstairs since i think very few of us have we have been too busy ellen would go in of course to prepare the bed did she yes it was ellen who told me i was in the hall and she came out of the kitchen and said oh mademoiselle do you know your beautiful bottle is broken mademoiselle's voice broke she held out the pieces and exclaimed in broken tones and i ran and i saw this i am sorry i am grieved but we must get to the bottom of this mystery things do not fall over and break by themselves girls do any of you know anything about this if so please speak out at once and don't be afraid to tell the truth if by any chance one of you has unintentionally broken mademoiselle's bottle i know you will be as deeply grieved as she can be herself but the only thing you can do now is to explain and beg her forgiveness carelessness it must have been and you cannot hope to escape altogether without punishment but remember deception is fifty times worse i have no mercy on a girl who knows she is guilty and lets her companions rest under the shadow of suspicion now i ask you again do you know anything at all of the cause of this accident there was a unanimous burst of denial from all parts of the room but different girls took the question in different ways as was natural to the different characters some looked grieved some indignant a few showed suspicions of tears and pixie looked so thoroughly scared and miserable that more than one eye rested curiously upon her miss phipps glanced around with her keen scrutinizing glance then pressed her lips together and said sharply this becomes serious you all deny it very well i must find out the truth for myself call ellen please mademoiselle i am sorry to have such a painful ending to our happy holiday but we cannot go to bed with this cloud hanging over us ellen mademoiselle tells me that you found the scent bottle broken when you went into her room just now to turn down the bed ellen straightened herself and fumbled miserably with the corner of her apron she loved all the girls and had known many of them for years for though other maids might come and go ellen like the brook went on for ever she had been a servant in the phipps family and had accompanied her young lady when holly house was bought and the school first founded matron nurse general factotum and refuge in time of trouble it would have been as easy to suspect her of duplicity as miss phipps herself she was wretched now because she feared that her children might be in trouble and her children knew it and loved her for her fear 
i did miss emily it was lying just where it usually stands with the glass piled up in a little heap it looked then as if someone had arranged it so not as if it had been say blown over by chance it couldn't have blown over miss emily it was too heavy and it wasn't near the window either and the pieces you say were gathered together as if someone had placed them so very well i understand now ellen have any of the other maids been upstairs to your knowledge since mademoiselle left her room at seven o'clock they say they have not miss for i asked them and i've been in the kitchen all the time we were busy clearing away after tea and getting the refreshments ready for supper and then we came and watched the young ladies dance you would have noticed if anyone had gone upstairs i think i should being together all the time they have no work upstairs at this hour i know that but i must speak to them myself later on there is one thing more ellen your work upstairs takes you a good time in passing to and fro you didn't happen to see anyone in or near mademoiselle's room i suppose speak up please remember i rely upon you to do all in your power to help me get to the bottom of this mystery these last words were added in a warning voice for ellen's start of dismay and drawn miserable brows too plainly betrayed the truth of her mistress's surmise i saw when i went up first in the middle of the dancing i was at the end of the passage and i saw little miss o'shaughnessy coming out of a room i couldn't be sure but i thought it was mademoiselle's she had said it and in an instant every eye in the room was riveted upon pixie and every heart sank woefully at the sight of her crimson agitated face it said much for the hold which she had gained upon her companion's affections that at this moment the feeling in every girl's breast was that she would prefer to find the culprit in almost any other girl in the school than in dear loving kind-hearted irish pixie perhaps miss phipps felt the same but it did not become her to show favouritism and her voice was very stern and cold come here pixie please stand before me you've heard what ellen says was it mademoiselle's room out of which you were coming it was miss phipps said pixie with a gulp and a groan of dismay sounded through the room at which miss phipps's eyes sent out a flashing glance silence please leave this to me was it you who let the bottle fall and broke it then though you would not acknowledge it when i asked just now pixie's lips moved but she seemed so paralyzed with fear that she had to repeat her words twice over before they could be heard no i didn't break it miss phipps i didn't break it do you mean to say you know nothing about it did you not notice it when you were in the room may i ask what you were doing in that room at all you had no business in there i please miss phipps the gas was down i didn't see anything i asked you pixie what were you doing in that room to the dismay of her companions pixie hung her head and refused to answer and when the question was repeated had no reason to offer but a stammering it was nothing i was doing nothing that is nonsense pixie you would not go upstairs and into a strange room to-night of all nights without a very definite reason i insist upon your telling me what you were doing if it is nothing of which you are ashamed you need surely not hesitate to speak i wasn't doing anything i never touched it said pixie once more and an expression came over her face which was well known to the inhabitants of valley william though so far it was unfamiliar to her companions a dumb obstinate look which promised little satisfaction to the questioner if you refuse to answer me pixie it is your own fault if i suspect you 
you have been with us only a short time but i have always believed you to be truthful and straightforward i should be sorry to change my opinion but you will have yourself to blame she paused and looked down at the little black figure and her face softened regretfully you need not look so terrified child mademoiselle is naturally very grieved and distressed but you know her well enough to be sure that she would forgive you if you have unintentionally broken her pretty bottle she would be sorry to drive you into telling a falsehood wouldn't you mademoiselle i shall say nothing to her my bottle is gone and it can do no good now but she had no right to touch my things my room is my own and she had no business there at all i thought you were a good girl pixie and remembered what i had said to you i did not think you would grieve me like this i have not so many treasures mademoiselle's tears trickled down afresh and the girls began to look askance at pixie and to feel the first incredulity give place to a horrible doubt why wouldn't she speak why did she look so guilty why need she have been so alarmed at the first mention of the accident if she had no part in bringing it about margaret held out her hand with an involuntary gesture of appeal and pixie seeing it shut her lips more tightly than ever you may go to your room pixie said miss phipps coldly i am very much disappointed in you End of chapter 8、chapter 9 of Pixie O'Shaughnessy by Mrs. George D. Horned Vasey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dark Days. The three girls who shared Pixie's room were not forbidden to speak to her when they went upstairs to bed and their first impulse was to pull aside the curtains of her cubicle where she was discovered lying on top of the bed still fully dressed with features swollen and disfigured with crying she was shivering too and the hand which kate touched was so icy cold that she exclaimed in horrified reproach pixie you are freezing what do you mean by not getting into bed you will catch a chill and then goodness knows what may happen you may go into consumption and die pixie gave a dismal little sniff and her teeth chattered together that's what i thought a girl at bolly william died of a chill and consumption's in our family me mother's cousin suffered from it every winter i want to die here sit up i am going to unhook you dear me what a mess you have made of your fine collar i don't know what lottie will say when she sees it lucky girl to be out to-night and escape all this fuss she always gets the best of things i never wish to spend such an evening again i know that pixie why wouldn't you tell why wouldn't you answer miss phipps cried flora unable to contain herself a moment longer and pixie drew herself up and tried to look dignified a difficult achievement when one is being forcibly undressed and can hardly see out of red swollen eyelids i told her i had not broken the bottle i gave her a straight answer and that ought to be enough for any lady don't talk such rubbish this house is not yours and if you go wandering about into strange rooms it is only right that you should be made to explain and it looks so bad when you refuse to answer you don't realize how bad it looks after you left the room miss phipps asked if we had heard you say anything which would explain your going into that room and we all remembered we didn't want to tell but we were obliged we remembered that you said you intended to have a good look at that scent bottle so i did and i don't mind who you tell i looked at it the very next day but i never lifted it once i was too afraid i'd be hurting it and it was all right long after that mademoiselle said so herself the three girls looked at each other quickly and as quickly averted their eyes 
ethel gave a toss to her curls and walked off to her cubicle kate went on unhooking with relentless haste and flora sat down heavily on the edge of the bed and melted into tears i wish scent bottles had never been invented i wish that old marquise had had more sense than to spend her money on a thing that would break if you looked at it i know how easy it would be i've broken lots of things myself mother always said to us when we were children don't be afraid to tell me if you've had an accident i will never scold you if you tell the truth but if i find out that you've hidden anything from me i shall be extremely angry lots of girls tell stories just because they are frightened especially little ones and when they are strange too and don't know people well but we all love you pixie really and truly we do we won't turn against you oh do tell do tell tell kate and me now before we go to bed and we will help you to-morrow will miss phipps talk to me again to-morrow will she be cross again will mademoiselle be cross cried pixie fearfully oh what will i do what will i do no one was ever cross with me at home i'll run away in the night and swim over to ireland they'd welcome me there if i'd smashed all the scent bottles in the world i never meant to do any harm i didn't know it was wrong to go into mademoiselle's room no one ever said i mustn't molly our maid broke something every day of her life at bolly william and no one disturbed themselves about it what's a scent bottle suppose i had broken it why should they make such a storm i should like to know her sentences were broken by sobs and tears and her companions had learnt by now that pixie's outbursts of grief were not to be trifled with for while other girls shed tears in a quiet and ladylike manner pixie grew hysterical on the slightest pretext and sobbed and wailed and shivered and shook and drowned herself in tears until she was in a condition of real physical collapse to-night kate signalled imperiously to flora to depart to her own cubicle and herself bundled the shaking quivering little creature into bed where she left her with a good night sufficiently sympathetic but oh agonies to a sensitive heart without attempting the kiss which had become a nightly institution next morning pixie's face was still swollen and puffy but her elastic spirits had sufficiently recovered to enable her to make repeated attempts to converse with her taciturn companions and to run in and out of their cubicles to play lady's maid as usual in such useful unostentatious ways as carrying water folding nightgowns and tying hair ribbons this morning she was even more assiduous than usual in her attentions for there was an edge of coldness and reserve in the manner even of flora herself which cut deeply into the sensitive heart then when she had fully dressed she gathered together lottie's fineries and betook herself to the room which that luxurious young lady occupied in solitary splendour early as she had been in leaving her cubicle breakfast had already begun when pixie made her appearance downstairs and the furtive manner in which she entered the room was not calculated to dispel the suspicions with which she was regarded her good morning to the teachers was a mere mumble and oh how formidable they looked miss phipps with tight lips and back like a poker mademoiselle a vision of misery and fraulein and miss bruce staring at the tablecloth as if afraid to raise their eyes as for the girls they munched away in silence no one daring to make a remark and it was significant of the solemnity of the occasion that not a single girl helped herself to marmalade or jam by the unwritten laws of the school it would have been considered unfeeling to indulge in such luxuries while the reputation of a companion was at stake it was a ghastly occasion and pixie seemed literally to shrink in stature as she cowered in her chair glancing to right and left with quick terrified glances the hopefulness of the earlier morning had departed and among all the dejected faces round the table hers was conspicuously the worst there seemed a special meaning in the bible reading that morning and 
when miss phipps laid aside the book she added a few words of her own before kneeling in prayer the sternness had left her face but it was very grave and sad before we kneel down together this morning girls there are some thoughts which i would like to impress upon you all we are in trouble and it behooves each one of us to ask in all earnestness that the cloud may be lifted and that courage and truthfulness may be given where it is most needed an accident however regrettable is not a serious offence but in this instance it has been turned into one by the refusal of the culprit to acknowledge her offence i have made every inquiry and it seems morally certain that one of you must know how it happened and be able to give a satisfactory explanation and until she does so the shadow of her deceit must fall on all i ask those of you who know that they are blameless to pray for her who is guilty that she may acknowledge her fault and for yourselves that you be preserved from temptation and i ask the guilty one to remember that god reads all hearts and although she may deceive her companions she can hide nothing from his eyes and now we will kneel and pray and let the words which you say be no vain repetition but the earnest cry of your hearts that god will help us many of the girls had tears in their eyes as they rose from their knees and no one was surprised when as they filed slowly towards the door miss phipps spoke again to request pixie o'shaughnessy to follow her to her private sanctum flora thrust her hand through lottie's arm as they went upstairs and heaved a sigh of funereal proportions oh, poor little pixie don't you pity her oh lottie you are lucky to have been out last night and escape all this bother i wish i had had an invitation too and then even if pixie doesn't confess no one could possibly think that i had done it poor little thing she is so scared that she hardly knows what she is doing did you notice her face at breakfast did you hear about the accident when you came in last night or who told you first i only saw the teachers last night but mademoiselle was crying and i knew something was wrong then pixie came to my room this morning to bring me back my collar and she told me it seems that she is suspected because she won't tell why she was in mademoiselle's room it is very stupid of her there can't be any great mystery about it one would think though she wouldn't even tell me but if she says she didn't break the bottle i think she ought to be believed she has always been truthful so far as we know yes but then we haven't known her long and she has never been in a corner before it is easy to tell the truth when all is going smoothly but it's rather dreadful when you know quite well you're going to be punished and if you let the first moment pass it's fifty times worse because then you have been deceitful as well what i'm afraid of is that she was too frightened to own up last night you know what a scary little thing she is and that now she is determined to be obstinate and brave it out lottie hitched her shoulder with an impatient movement which drew her arm free from her companion well i'm fond of pixie o'shaughnessy and i'm going to stick to her whatever happens it's mean of mademoiselle to make such a fuss about an accident which nobody could help i'll buy her another scent bottle myself if that will satisfy her i have lots of money and can get as much more as i want it's absurd making thirty people miserable for the sake of a few pounds i'll ask miss phipps if i may go into town and buy one this very day she won't let you spend so much without your mother's consent and it's my belief that mademoiselle wouldn't take it if she did it was the association she liked and you could not give her that i'm fond of pixie too but i shan't like her a bit if she gets us all into trouble and that's what it will mean if she is obstinate we shall have all our treats and holidays knocked off until the truth comes out it is bound to be discovered sooner or later don't you think no i don't lots of things are never discovered and the holidays will be here in a month thank goodness it will have to drop after that for it wouldn't be fair to drag the troubles of one term into the next i don't know what margaret's going to do but i shall be kind to pixie and try to help her 
the girls had reached the schoolroom by this time and joined the group by the fire so that margaret herself was able to reply i shall certainly help her if i can she said gently but her followers noticed that she avoided giving any opinion as to guilt or innocence and the reticence depressed them still further for it was unlike margaret to refrain from speaking a good word if it was possible to do so she was soon to have an opportunity of trying to help however for half an hour later miss phipps called her out of class and said sadly i can make nothing of pixie margaret will you try what you can do she seems afraid of me though i have tried to be as forbearing as possible and perhaps she may speak more freely to a girl like herself so long as she refuses to say what she was doing in mademoiselle's room we cannot help believing her to be guilty i am dreadfully upset about it all and should be so thankful to get at the truth i've heard of this kind of thing going on in other schools but this is my first experience and i earnestly hope it will be the last she is in my snuggery go to her there and see what your influence will do margaret went and at the first opening of the door pixie rushed into her arms with a cry of joyous welcome oh margaret i hoped you would come i wanted you to come i'm so dreadfully miserable so are we all pixie but you can end the misery if you will only tell us truthfully all you know about this accident you do know something i feel certain or why should you be so afraid to speak it's no use being afraid dear we all have to do difficult things sometimes whether we like them or not and it will only get worse as time goes on the truth is bound to come out and then how ashamed you will feel if you have not taken the opportunity while it was yours do you think it will be found out really pixie shivered and twisted her fingers together in nervous fashion but how can it if i don't tell and if if there is no one else i don't know pixie but i believe it will sooner or later it may be later for god is very patient and waits to give us our chance before he takes things into his own hands in the days when jesus was on earth he used to work miracles but he doesn't do that any longer i used to be sorry for that but i am not now for it is so wonderful that he lets us help him by putting it into our hearts to do his will he won't show us in any miraculous way who is deceiving us now but if she will listen he will speak to her and make it seem impossible to go on doing wrong that's what bridgie said agreed pixie eagerly it was the night before i came to school and she was speaking to me for my own good you'll be far away from home she said but you never need be far from him and he is your best friend when you are happy and everything is bright thank him for it for it's a shame to be always asking asking and never saying a thank you for what you receive and when you are undecided between two ways take the one that's hardest for that was what he meant by bearing the cross and when you are in trouble keep still she says keep still and you'll hear his voice in your heart and i was thinking of that last night and i could hear bridgie saying it all over again as plain as if she were by my side and the other voice pixie did you hear that too i tried to but the small troubled face was pitiful to behold it seemed always to say the things i wanted and i was afraid i was imagining then i remembered about doing the hardest thing and every time i awoke i thought of it again and this morning i decided that i would pixie cried margaret in a tone of almost incredulous relief oh pixie you will really i am so glad so glad you will come with me to miss phipps now and tell all you know but pixie shook her head firmly and her lips closed in determined lines i will never tell she said i'll be silent for ever end of chapter nine chapter ten of pixie o'shaughnessy by mrs george de horn vesey 
this librivox recording is in the public domain an armistice a week passed by and the mystery was no nearer being unravelled than on the first evening though every possible means had been taken to discover the offender at the beginning of the time the general feeling had been in favour of pixie but girls are very human creatures and as the days passed by and they suffered for her silence a feeling of resentment began to grow against her why should all the school be suspected because one girl refused to tell what she knew what was the use of pretending to be so kind and helpful if you would not sacrifice your pride for your friend's comfort if pixie were innocent why should she be afraid to answer questions but really and then the heads would draw closer together and the voices drop to a whisper really she looked so wretched and ashamed that one began to wonder if she could be innocent after all a whole week and she had not once been in mischief didn't that look as if something was on her mind while as for funny stories she was as dull as clara herself and it was impossible to say anything more scathing than that after margaret's failure no more personal efforts had been made to induce pixie to confess but at the end of a week the anticipated blow fell for miss phipps addressed the assembled school and announced her intention of confiscating holidays until the end of the term i am sorry to punish the innocent with the guilty she said but i hope that the consciousness that she is depriving her companions of their enjoyment may have more influence with the culprit whoever she may be than any words of mine i don't think it is right to deprive your teachers of their much-needed rest so on wednesdays and saturdays you will have extra preparation during the hours which would otherwise have been your own of course no invitations can be accepted i have written to your brother pixie to say that you will not be able to go out with him on saturday as arranged pixie's cry of dismay was drowned by the general groan which swelled ever louder and louder as miss phipps left the room the younger girls looked inclined to cry one or two stamped on the floor with irrepressible anger and there was a very babble of indignation i told you so what did i say as if we hadn't enough to do without slaving six hours more i know what it will be now i shall get so worn out that i shall fail in my examination preparation more prep i call that adding insult to injury if it had been a class i wouldn't have minded half so much i'm sick and tired of school i'll ask my mother if i may leave the day i'm seventeen and i was going out on wednesday i had an invitation this morning and was going to tell miss phipps after tea i may as well write and say i can't go and it would have been so nice too i should have had such fun jack was going to take me to the the circus i've never seen a clown in all me days i was c counting the hours stammered pixie tearfully and at the sound of her voice as at a signal all the girls stopped talking and fixed their eyes upon her she looked pitiful enough with the tears streaming down her cheeks but there was not much sympathy in the watching faces and for the first time the growing resentment forced itself into words you have only yourself to blame kate said coldly if you had spoken up and told all you knew about that horrible night it would have been forgotten by this time i believe mademoiselle is sorry already that she made such a fuss but miss phipps won't rest until she has found out what she wants if you will be obstinate you must expect to be punished but it's hard lines on the rest of us who have done nothing wrong and we were all so kind to you pixie o'shaughnessy and made a regular pet of you you know we did we helped you like angels when you couldn't do your lessons 
i've been in this school five years and i've never seen a new girl made such a fuss of before i call you an ungrateful serpent to turn and rend us like this clowns indeed i should think you have something else to think of than clowns do you realize that thirty girls are losing their fun for three whole weeks because you won't speak if you had any nice feeling you would be too miserable for clowns oh pixie i've such a smashing headache you might tell i was so looking forward to a rest this afternoon it makes the week so dreadfully dreadfully long when there are no holidays flora's voice was full of tears and pixie's miserable glance roving from one speaker to another grew suddenly eager as it rested upon her for she was skilled in the treatment of headaches and was never more happy than when officiating as nurse i'll lend you my smelling bottle it's awful strong ye you said yourself the last time you smelt it ye forgot all about the pain will i run up this minute and bring it for you no thank you flora's tone was almost as cold as kate's i don't want your loans smelling bottles are no good to me if i have to rack my brains all the afternoon you needn't pretend to be sorry for if you were you could soon cure me come along girls let's go upstairs it's no use talking to her any longer the girls linked arms and filed to the door only lottie lingering behind to thrust her hand encouragingly through pixie's arm kate standing near caught the whispered words of consolation you shall go to the circus in the holidays i'll ask you to stay with me and we will go somewhere nice every afternoon and told herself reproachfully that lottie was more forgiving than herself i don't feel in the least inclined to offer her treats though i'm sorry for her all the same she does look such a woe-begone little wretch it's my belief she thought it was a good opportunity to examine the scent bottle when we were all upstairs and that she put it down too roughly or let it slip from her hands and hadn't the nerve to own up at once i don't wonder she's afraid to confess now i should be myself you don't know what might happen you might even be expelled i don't believe miss phipps would keep a girl who was so mean as to make all the school suffer rather than face a scolding there's one thing certain i'm not going to have pixie o'shaughnessy fagging for me until this business is cleared up i've tied my own hair bows before and can do them again and i shall tell flora and ethel not to allow her in their cubicles either if she is untruthful how are we to know that she might not be dishonest next there is no truer proverb than that which says give a dog a bad name and hang him for it is certain that when once we begin to harbour suspicion a dozen little actions and coincidences arise to strengthen us in our convictions it is also true that no judges are so unflinching as very young people who set a hard line between right and wrong and are unwilling to acknowledge the existence of extenuating circumstances during the next few weeks pixie was sent to coventry by her companions to her own unutterable grief and confusion no one offered to help her with difficult lessons no one invited her to be a companion in the daily crocodile no one made room for her when she entered a room on the contrary she was avoided as if her very presence were infectious and when she spoke a silence fell over the room and several moments elapsed before a cold stern voice would vouchsafe a monosyllabic answer she was at the bottom of her classes too being unable to learn in this atmosphere of displeasure and the governess's strictures had in them a touch of unusual severity curiously enough it was mademoiselle herself who showed most sympathy with pixie during those dark days like most people of impulsive temperament she had quick reactions of feeling and after having stormed and bewailed for a couple of days she began to regret the gloom into which she had plunged the school 
she had been fond of the droll little irish girl and though convinced of her guilt feared lest her own unbridled anger had frightened a sensitive child into a denial difficult to retract it happened one day that governess and pupil were alike suffering from cold and unable to go out for the usual walk and the impressionable french heart went out in a wave of pity as its owner entered the deserted schoolroom and found pixie seated alone by the fire her hands folded listlessly on her lap a very cinderella of misery and dejection when the door opened she looked up with that shrinking expression of dread which is so pitiful to see on a young face for to be left tete-a-tete with mademoiselle seemed under the circumstances the most terrible thing that could happen her head drooped forward over her chest and she stared fixedly at the floor while mademoiselle seated herself on a chair close by and stared at her with curious eyes surely the ugly little face was smaller the figure more absurdly minute than of yore the black dress with its folds of rusty crape added to the pathos of the picture and awoke remembrances of the dead mother who would never comfort her baby again nor point out the right way with wise tender words mademoiselle's thoughts went back to her own past when if the truth must be told she had been an exceedingly naughty child and she realized that it was not coldness and severity which had wrought the most good but the tender patience and affection of the kindest of parents what if they had been trying the wrong course with pixie o'shaughnessy what if suspicion and avoidance were but hardening the child's heart and hastening her path downwards mademoiselle cleared her throat and said in the softest tone which she could command eh bien pixie what are you doing sitting here all by yourself i'm thinking mademoiselle and what are you thinking about then tell me your thoughts for a penny as you girls say to each other i'm thinking of fox's martyrs was pixie's somewhat startling reply her face had lightened with immeasurable relief at the sound of the friendly voice and the talkative tongue once loosened could not resist the temptation to enlarge on the reply we have the book at home did ye ever see it mademoiselle it's got lovely pictures there's one man lying down and they are pinching him with hot tongs and another being stoned and another being boiled in oil they were so brave that they never screeched out but only sang hymns and prayed beautiful prayers i used to long to be a martyr too but i don't any more now for i know i couldn't bear it but it cheers me up to think about them bridgie says there's nothing so bad but it might be worse and i was thinking that they were worse off than me i'd rather even that the girls wouldn't speak to me than boiling oil wouldn't you mademoiselle i would indeed replied mademoiselle fervently but what a subject to think about on a dull grey day no wonder you look miserable you need not think about boiling oil just now at all events for i have to stay in too and i have come to sit here and talk to you will that make you feel a little bit less miserable now that depends on what ye talk about mademoiselle said pixie with that air of quaint candour which her companions had been wont to find so amusing and mademoiselle first smiled and then looked grave enough i am not going to question you about your trouble if you mean that pixie it is miss phipps's affair now not mine i wish you had been more outspoken but i am not going to scold you again you are being punished already and i feel sorry to see you so grave and to hear no more laughs and jokes shall we have what they call an armistice and talk together as we used to do when we were very good friends she held out her hand as she spoke and pixie's thin fingers grasped hers with a force that was almost painful she looked overcome with gratitude nevertheless now that it had been agreed to talk both felt a decided difficulty in deciding what to talk about 
for even a temporary coldness between friends heaps up many barriers and in this particular case it was difficult to feel once more at ease and unconstrained it was pixie who spoke first and her voice was full of shy eagerness how's your father mademoiselle is he having his health any better than it was a little yes a little better he is in the south with my brother until the cold winds are over in paris he is like me he hates to be cold so he is very happy down there in the sunshine i told you about him then did i i had forgotten that yes you told me that day when i when i lassoed you on the stairs and i wrote the verb not to be rude to you any more you said i would remember that and i do but perhaps you think i've done something worse than being rude mademoiselle i want to know please tell me can your bottle be stuck together so that you can use it again mademoiselle's face clouded over she had recovered from her first violent anger about the accident but it was still too sore a subject to be lightly touched no she said shortly it cannot mend i tried i thought i might use it still as an ornament but the pieces will not fit there is perhaps something missing i have just to make up my mind that it is gone forever it seems as if i should never know what happened to it an expression of undoubted relief and satisfaction passed over pixie's face as she heard these last words but mademoiselle was gazing disconsolately in the fire and it had passed before she looked up perhaps she had hoped that her words would draw forth some sort of confession but if so she was fated to be disappointed for when pixie spoke again it was to broach another subject mademoiselle i've a favour to ask you i've been afraid to do it before but you are so kind to-day that i'm not frightened any longer it's about the party at the end of the term the girls say they always have one and they will be broken-hearted if they miss that as well as all the holidays it is no use my asking because it's me that's in trouble but mademoiselle it was your bottle that was broken if you asked miss phipps she couldn't find the heart in her to say no please mademoiselle will you ask if the girls can have their party the same as ever mademoiselle looked as she felt completely taken aback by this unexpected request it sounded strange indeed coming from pixie's lips and it was difficult to explain to the girl that she herself would be the greatest hindrance to the granting of such a request she looked down fingered her dress in embarrassment and said slowly for my part i should be glad for the girls to have their party it is hard that they should all suffer and it is dull for them i have been here three years but it was never so dull as this yes i would ask but what would miss phipps say that is a different thing it seems odd to stop the holidays and give the party all the same and do you not see the bad girl the girl who will not say what she has done she would have her pleasure with the rest and that would not be right it is to punish her we have to punish many but if i stayed upstairs cried pixie eagerly and then stopped short with crimson cheeks as if startled by the sound of her own words i mean i am the one they are vexed with they want to punish me most if i stayed upstairs in my own room or was sent to bed why shouldn't the others have their party it would be an extra punishment to me to hear them dancing wouldn't it now mademoiselle threw up her hands in an expressive silence in all her experience of school life never before had she met a girl who pleaded in such coaxing terms for her own humiliation and she was at sea as to what it might mean either pixie was guilty in which case she was one of the most arrant little hypocrites that could be imagined or she was innocent and a marvel of sweetness and charity which could it be a moment before she had felt sure that the former was the case now she was equally convinced of the latter in any case she was gratified by the idea that she herself should plead for the breaking up party and was ready to promise that she would interview miss phipps without delay 
and ye'll not say that i ever mentioned it urged pixie anxiously for maybe that would put her off altogether just asked as if it was a favour to yourself and if she asks what about pixie oh pixie says you never trouble about her send her to bed it will be good for her health she can lie still and listen to the music and amuse herself thinking of all she has lost the beaming smile with which this suggestion was offered was too much for mademoiselle's composure and do what she would she could not restrain a peal of laughter <laughs> you are a ridiculous child but i will do as you say and hope for success i like parties too but it will not be half so nice if you are not there petite see i was angry at first and when i am angry i say many sharp things but i am not angry any more if it had happened to be any one to break my bottle by mistake she need no more be frightened to tell me i would not be angry now wouldn't you queried pixie eagerly but instantly her face fell and she shivered as with dread but oh miss phipps would she would be angrier than ever the girls say so and it is only a fortnight longer before the holidays and then we shall all go home if it is not found out before the holidays it will be all over then won't it no one will say anything about it next term i do not know pixie i can't tell what miss phipps will do returned mademoiselle sadly she felt no doubt at this moment that pixie was guilty but that only strengthened her in her decision to plead for the party for it did indeed seem hard that twenty-nine girls should be deprived of their pleasure for the sake of one obstinate wrongdoer. End of chapter 10